More now about the suspect accused of attacking three New York City police officers with a machete near Times Square on New Year's Eve. 19-year-old Trevor Bickford was already on the FBI's terror watch list as a possible Islamic extremist. The New York Post reports he targeted the officers as a, quote, enemy of the state. Let's bring in Paul Morrow, retired NYPD inspector and founder of OpsDesk.org. Paul, great to see you this morning. Um, a lot to talk about here. First of all, this attack on these police officers in New York City. I want to play a little piece of sound from Mayor Eric Adams and what he said about the attack. Let's take a listen. One of the officers uh, heard from the police commissioner and I just a few days ago at his graduation. It just goes to show you if it's not the first day or it could be your last day, the actions that police officers must take every day uh, are life-threatening uh, situations. So, of course, that's true. Uh, everybody knows that. But the question here is, if this had to happen, the suspect, 19-year-old Trevor Bickford, was on the terror watch list. The FBI knew he had been radicalized because his aunt told them he wanted to go and fight with the Taliban overseas. So should the FBI have been watching him more closely? Is there more they could have done, in your opinion? Well, a couple of things I would say. First of all, we don't know that they were not. There's the possibility of a human failure here, which is that he was on their radar screen as, uh, you know, has become apparent. And maybe he was just lost in the crowd of a million people in and around Times Square. You don't want that to happen. That's troubling. But, uh, you know, it's a human failure that we're all guilty of. I think what's more serious and something that I think would be more troubling is if we determine that there was a bureaucratic breakdown here. Uh, he apparently did have an open case on him in Boston, and that's a subtlety as well. Why the Boston field office? He's a Maine resident. So that argues to me that there was a reason they decided to open in Boston. Um, did he make some sort of a threat relative to Boston? Did they think he might go there for the New Year's Eve event in uh, Copley Square or something? So he had been interviewed. His own family uh, had given him up over the last month, apparently, as somebody that needed to be looked at and who had some jihadi ideation. And so I think commensurate with the investigation into his computers, into his phone, his radicalization, why he did what he did, we should have an outward-facing investigation that lets us know what occurred here, that lets the public know. And the danger is that we just move on and say, well, this could have been worse. Thank God it wasn't worse. I think that mm -hmm. what we need to see is what happened, not to blame anybody, but to fix mm -hmm. it so that we're better going forward. Yeah, just a little more transparency about what was going on behind the scenes, because this kid, I mean, he's a kid, 19 years old. He looks like the all-American kid. Apparently, he got radicalized after his father died of an overdose when he right. was just 18. So just last year, maybe he felt lost and confused. But the question is, how many other Trevor Bickfords are out there? And, you know, should we worry that the FBI are not watching these people closely enough? Maybe they should be more transparent about what they're doing behind the scenes. So in our system, it's actually quite difficult to do this kind of work. We don't arrest for thought crimes. You have to hit a certain mm -hmm. threshold legally to be able to take certain actions against people who are sort of bubbling up, for lack of a better term, with uh, jihadi aspirations. But once you do hit that threshold, there are things that you can do. And Anita, I think you make a good point. We've grown a little bit complacent, I would argue. There are some troubling signs coming out across the world, uh, certain data points that may indicate that we're seeing a little bit of the terrorism stuff that we all were happy to put into the rearview mirror. In my estimation, that's a mistake. Um, we're seeing some of it bubbling up again. And so I do think this is something that, uh, you know, all of us need to take into uh, uh, account here. Washington, local law enforcement, et cetera, needs to take another look at a lot of the mechanisms that were in, a, in place post 9-11. Because as we used to say in the PD, the further we get from 9-11, the closer we get to 9-10. We yeah, can't have yeah. that. You know, this could have been yeah. a lot worse. You know, there's some reporting that he was maybe even reaching for one of the cops' guns or something mm. like that. We can't just say, well, you know what, we got lucky there. We have to make sure that this kind of thing is interdicted going forward. And, Paul, uh, real quick, I want to turn the topic to the uh, Idaho murders, because I know you spent a lot of time on the ground there in Moscow with right. Lawrence Jones, talking to investigators, um, walking around the house, really getting to know the area well. What questions do you want answered when that affidavit is unsealed? And what about the murder weapon? Hasn't been found yet. Right. Where, do you, where should investigators be looking? Qu quick answer here. 
Well, a quick answer being, I don't know, um, but I will say that, um, you know, you put your finger on it, the, the murder weapon is a very big uh, open data point. I would also argue that how he found this house, because it is uh, off the beaten track, how it is that he original made con originally made contact, was it online, was it digitally, was it in person, how it is that he decided this was the location that he was going to target, I think is a very big open question we'd all like to know. Mm -hmm. And there were areas in, uh, in and around this, uh, this house there is the Arboretum next door. There's a golf course. Um, did the police look at that? There's bodies of water in there. Were those bodies of water dragged? So, you know, these are just questions that some of us have from outside, not having the intimate details of the investigation. Those are just some of the points that I think a lot of us are wondering who have been tracking this case closely. Yeah, uh, investigators and everyday citizens all over the country, uh, these are questions they want to know. They have been following this story. Paul Morrow, thank you so much for joining us today and giving your insight, and Happy New Year.